Good morning and a warm welcome to the Latrobe Financial Investor Call for April. I'm Michael Watson, Head of Distribution, Asia Pacific at Latrobe Financial. Thank you for joining us. During today's presentation, your lines will be in listen only mode. We've had a number of questions sent to us ahead of time and we'll try to address these questions throughout the presentation in the relevant places. We'll also take questions at the end of the presentation if time permits. To submit questions at any time during the presentation, please click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Please note, we won't be able to speak to individual account questions in this forum, but our investor team is always available to take your calls and questions on 1800 818 818. I'll now hand over to our Chief Investment Officer, Chris Andrews. Thanks, Michael, and good morning to all joining our April Investor Call. And that's whether you're a first-time attendee or a regular, it's great to be with you. And it's also great to see how strongly the economy has rebounded from the COVID hibernation period. It really has been the V-shaped recovery that no one thought was possible. And ordinary Australians, of course, have benefited enormously, most especially through the incredibly robust recovery and employment data, which has just been wonderful news. For investors, though, the story is more mixed. Asset prices are high and interest rates are low. That makes it incredibly difficult to generate the consistent low volatility income that so many investors require. Now, at Latrobe Financial, we're acutely aware of that dilemma. We are leaning in to do our bit to help. So we'll explore all of those themes in today's presentation. To start with, we'll take a quick look as we always do at the Latrobe Financial Group and how we've positioned the business as of April in 2021. And there are four key points about our business that every customer and partner should know. First, Latrobe Financial has long been recognized as Australia's leading asset class specialist. And that's since we commenced operation in 1952. We have 12 billion in assets under management and 450 staff. Secondly, our business has two key growth engines. Our asset management business is familiar to all of our investors. It's spearheaded by our $5.6 billion credit fund, which has over 51,000 investors and operates in the $3.2 trillion managed fund sector. Our real estate credit finance business draws on our really deep expertise in credit and it delivers one of the broadest product suites available in the $2.5 trillion residential and commercial mortgage markets. Now, both of these markets, the asset management and the finance markets have enormous depth and diversity. And what that offers is a series of tremendous opportunities for us to grow and strengthen our offerings for the benefit of all of our investors. Thirdly, both of these engines have been tested across many de decades of operation. We've managed funds, we've built loan portfolios for many of the world's largest and most sophisticated banks, financial institutions and fund managers. And we've learned to build these portfolios as we build our business with the asset quality, uh, the diversification, the portfolio construction disciplines to weather the ups and downs of the economic cycle. Haven't the last 12 months been a, been a fine example of that? And the 51,000 investors in the credit fund benefit from this same investment philosophy, from the application of, of these same disciplines and from that same expertise. Finally, we are a portfolio company of the New York-based Blackstone Group. Now, Blackstone, Blackstone has over $619 billion US in assets under management, and Blackstone owns 75% of the business, with the remainder owned by senior management. Blackstone's global network of businesses gives us real-time insights into market trends, and that complements the insights that we derive from the circa $12 billion in assets we originate each and every year. Now, a key point of difference for our business is the diversity of our funding base. We have an unparalleled funding book. That funding book spans the world's largest banks and financial institutions with whom we have 3.6 billion in investment mandates. It then crosses debt capital markets. We've issued almost 7 billion in our MBS bonds and we'll do another 2 billion or so this year. And of course, we have our $5.6 billion credit fund that most of our listeners will be very familiar with. This profile is unique in the market and it allows us to capitalize on growth and portfolio opportunities beyond those that our peers can pursue. And that's to the benefit of all of our investors. Importantly, 
all growth opportunities that we do pursue are pursued with an unwavering commitment to asset quality. The quality of our assets is what we're known for. It drives the outcomes for investors and we are utterly focused on maintaining the very highest standards of investment and portfolio construction discipline. On your screen, you can see that the asset quality that we have delivered has improved materially as our business has grown. In June 2016, five years ago, prime and super prime assets, which are the highest credit quality loans that we invest in, were 28.2% of the portfolio, which is a really strong component of the portfolio. However, by the end of March this year in 2021, that percentage had grown to more than 38%. Conversely, the higher yielding but somewhat riskier special asset, specialist assets were 19.1% in 2016. They're now below 9%. So that's a 50% reduction over that period. Further evidence of the quality of our borrowers can be seen from the average credit scores of our borrower applicants. Third party data from Equifax. Now Equifax are the third party provider of the credit history report that we and most other lenders review as part of our credit assessment process. This third party data confirms that the average applicant to Latrobe Financial has a materially higher credit score than that of our non-bank peer group. And you can see that on the right hand side of your screen. In in fact, early this year, the average credit score of our borrower applicants even overtook that of the big four banks, and that was after running neck and neck for the last 12 months or so. That's pretty clear evidence of the quality of the borrowers in our portfolio, as well as the rigour that we bring to all of our investment offerings. Driving this operation, of course, is the deepest, is the most experienced and the most expert leadership team in the industry. Our CEO and senior vice presidents have collectively over a century in the business. That's more than 17 years each on average. And generally with extensive industry experience in finance, banking and the law prior to joining Latrobe Financial. We've built an incredible bench of industry and subject matter experts across all of the disciplines relevant to our investors. Uh, so um, that's... Um, uh, their, their skills span uh, disciplines like portfolio construction, credit, finance, and so on. Move on then to the next page. Uh, and ESG. So we've, sorry, just a, a few little technical troubles here. If we turn now to our next page, ESG, and we just bring that up on screen. Thank you. There have been for very many years, a really welcome focus on corporations contributing to society more broadly. While we've been always very mission focused at Latrobe Financial, these broader considerations are now generally summarized as ESG and they've always been fundamental to our approach to business. Indeed, the notion of serving the underserved borrower, a social loan in today's language, is why we were founded back in 1952. We know that the social license under which we operate depends on us continually renewing through our actions the reservoir of trust that we have built with our customers and business partners. So today we have a wholly integrated approach to ESG. In 2020, in fact, we appointed one of our longest serving and most experienced executives, Katerina Neshi, our former head of marketing, as our director of ESG. Kat brings an incredibly deep knowledge of our business to her role, and that has enabled her to capture and to integrate the drivers of our ESG strategy. And as you can see from the table on screen, our impact on the community goes well beyond the merely financial. So let's take a look at this. Our governance framework, the G in ESG, has always been industrial strength and of the highest standards. That's a natural consequence perhaps of the breadth and sophistication of the investors for whom we have been managing money for seven decades. We have an incredibly experienced and qualified board and a strong culture of compliance organization wide. Our transparency is best in market. And I think you can see that from the portfolio data we provide to you, our investors and to the market generally each and every month. 
The S in ESG stands for social. So we're doing them in reverse order here, if you like. At a social level, we are fiercely committed to remaining the values-based organisation that was founded by Ray O'Neill in 1952. We've donated over $16.2 million to various community charities and causes. In fact, you know, the last year has been a really difficult one for Australia, and we've done our bit to lean in. Uh, we donated a million dollars to assist victims of the bushfires just over 12 months ago. We donated another million to the Epworth Hospital for coronavirus preparation. And now we've made available just recently up to a million dollars for customers affected by the recent floods in New South Wales and Queensland. The final letter in ESG is E, of course, and at an environmental level, our executive committee has recently made a commitment to taking the business to carbon neutrality by 2030. On top of that, we're actively building towards a green RMBS bond and potentially a green offering within the credit fund as well. Now, we've been taking a lot of queries on these issues, so please rest assured, we will continue to work on these initiatives in the months ahead, and you'll be hearing about them in these webinars. So on that note, let's turn to our credit fund and review our portfolio settings and performance at the end of the March quarter. And our April portfolio snapshot and metrics report is on our website, freely available to all investors, advisors and interested parties. It really does give an incredibly detailed overview as to how our portfolio managers have positioned our portfolios. You can see our distribution rates on screen. They are strong and they have remained incredibly consistent throughout the coronavirus event. That consistency is, of course, a consequence of the resilience of the underlying assets in the portfolio. You can also see on screen key technical metrics metrics that investment analysts use to assess the performance of the fund. Alpha measures, and we'll say this in non-technical language, our ability to beat the market. The sharp and information ratios use two different methodologies to evaluate the risk adjusted rate of return of investment portfolios. And they use the risk-free and the benchmark rates as baseline comparators respectively. All of these outcomes are incredibly strong, they're incredibly consistent, and they point to the enduring outperformance of our offerings. The fund's performance over time has been rewarded with strong net inflows. Anecdotally, look, we continue to hear from investors that consistent low income, uh, low volatility income is in short supply. And I'm sure that's a surprise to no one on this call. And our credit fund does have a notable track record of meeting that need. You can see from aggregate assets under management and quarterly movement by account graphs that the credit fund has resumed its pre-pandemic growth trajectory. It's up almost 15% year on year, which is well ahead of our expectations, certainly our expectations of 12 months ago, and is very pleasing. Interestingly, the credit fund's componentry at account level has changed over the last 12 months. The fund's average investment tenor is up by 8.2%. And that's, that's occurred as investors have moved their investments towards our 12 month and high yield accounts. Now that's a material improvement to our already strong liquidity profile. So also has been a very welcome development. Finally, look, it would be remiss of me not to note that our 12 month term account has passed 4 billion in assets under management. Look, it's been a terrific performer for investors since its inception in October, 2002. So it's really pleasing to see the level of support it's received from all of our investors. Thanks to you for that. At a geographical level, look, our focus continues to be on the population hubs. Major city and eastern seaboard exposures are central to our strategy here. Our portfolios are overwhelmingly in metropolitan locations, again, major population centres, and that will continue to be our strategy for the foreseeable future. Those who have been following these webinars over the last 12 months will know that we very deliberately tilted our portfolios to residential loans through the COVID-19 period. And we did that very deliberately as an additional overlay of conservatism at a difficult time in markets. Now that has served its purpose very well. The performance profile has been very robust. We are certainly happy now to see our commercial exposures start slowly to rebuild. I always make this point, however, our portfolios are built bottom up on an asset by asset basis. That does mean that portfolio holdings move very organically and it will be some time before you would expect to see any material changes in our portfolio holdings or trends. 
And we're super comfortable with that. That really, in our view, is the right way to build a strategy like ours. Now, we do take some questions from time to time about inner city apartment exposures. So you can see on screen that they're not really material exposures for our portfolios. We've never been to this point a big lender in that space, which isn't to say there aren't terrific uh, loans and opportunities in that area. It's never really simply been a, a focus of our strategy. Our management bias on a liquidity front is now very firmly to progressively reinvest the excess cash that we're holding, particularly in our shorter dated classic and 90 day accounts. Once again, however, this will be done on an asset by asset basis. We're not gonna be rushed with this process. We're very comfortable with steady progressive reinvestment. We're also going to continue to watch macro market and geopolitical developments to ensure that we have plenty of tactical optionality in our liquidity positioning. We do remain one of the very few funds in the sector that has always met redemption requests in full at maturity. And we're entirely focused on retaining that track record. And we say that across all of our offerings. If that means we sit overweight in cash at times, we're very happy holders of that position. Now, our portfolio managers continue to retain the discipline of reporting on the loans in our portfolios in which borrowers are under pandemic-related hardship arrangements. You can see that each month in our snapshot metric reports, the very last line. Pleasingly, the rapid pace with which borrowers have returned to normal repayments means that hardship levels are really now immaterial across the fund. So there's just 26 loans in total at the end of March, and that's across a loan with 8,824 loans. Just as pleasingly, the transition from hardship to arrears has also been much less than expected. And we'll explore that in a little bit more detail at a moment. But I'll just pause here for a moment. And I say that to, to send the thoughts of the entire Latrobe Financial team to those of our customers and our business partners affected by the incredible recent floods in New South Wales and Queensland. Uh, Australia is truly a land of droughts and flooding rains. We've all heard that famous poem. We know that these floods have caused genuine difficulties in many parts of our great country. We were pleased to be able to do our bit to assist customers affected via the floods. And we did that via the Latrobe Financial Foundation. As I mentioned earlier, we've set up, we've set up a fund of up to a million dollars to provide grants to customers affected by the floods. Thankfully, so far, it appears that the impact on our book has been very minimal. We have, in fact, in the credit fund, just two affected loans experiencing temporary interruption to business and cash flows. No losses expected from those loans at this point. But on the back of a difficult year, we've had the bushfires, we've had the pandemics, our thoughts are with those affected, as they are indeed with the victims of Cyclone Saroja, particularly in Kalbari and Northampton in WA. So difficult time for Australians. Remarkably, amidst all of this turmoil, and despite the fact that this time of year is generally just uh, from a trend level, from a seasonality level, it's generally when we see the highest levels of arrears in our portfolios, arrears levels have continued their declining trend. They're now at around long-term averages across our book. Now, we had been expecting two to three percentage points of hardship borrowers to transition into long-term arrears and workout status. So this outcome has been a really strong one indeed for investors. The especially pleasing part of this is that new arrears loans are at exceptionally low levels. And you can see that if you study in particular the blue sections of the stacked column graphs on the left-hand side of your screen. Borrowers are transitioning out of hardship arrangements and in some cases off JobKeeper, but are returning to normal monthly repayments as scheduled. That's a testament to the resilience of our borrowers and also to the strength of the economic rebound post hibernation. As this year progresses, we'll work through some of the backlog of more aged arrears. So we do have a bit of a backlog of borrowers, for example, who went into default late last year when the property market was effectively closed. Our mortgage help team will be working very closely and very sensitively with those borrowers, but our priority is, as it always is, the protection of investor capital. 
as the table on the right hand side of the screen shows asset impairments or, or shortfalls across the fund portfolios, both on a one year and a three year basis are well below long term trends. Now that speaks to the quality of the book. While you do see some movements in the one year numbers, they can move around a bit by individual outcomes. The three year numbers are reflective of the overall improvement of asset quality in the book. So those, those uh, readings there on the right hand side of the screen are very pleasing indeed. Finally, the bottom line. During the month of March, portfolios continued to perform well above their respective benchmarks. This is a consistent outcome since the inception of our asset management operation back in 1990. The consistency of performance can be seen in the graph on your screens, and that shows the performance of $100,000 invested in the fund in October 2002 and compares it across a range of asset classes. The dark blue line is cash, green is property securities, light blue is bonds, red is global shares, gray is Australian shares, and purple is our classic notice account. The thick orange line is the 12 month term account and that started in October 2002. The returns that it has delivered over that time have been very strong, even in absolute terms across the 18 and a half year, that's 222 months. Um, but across that entire period, it has pr uh, uh, produced 100% capital stability and reliable consistent monthly income. Its performance, its low volatility income performance simply keeps delivering for investors month in, month out. And it's produced monthly income yields well above market for investors. Now that's of course important because it takes the question of having to correctly time the entrance or the exit of your investment off the table altogether. And timing can make a real difference for most asset classes. By contrast, our classic 90 day, 12 month and high yield accounts continue their flawless track record. None of these accounts have ever lost a cent of investor capital. None of them have ever missed a distribution. None of them has ever failed to pay an investor redemption at maturity. That's the performance profile we've delivered and that's the performance profile we've aimed to deliver for our investors over many, many decades of operation. So that's the summary of the portfolio. I'll turn now to an economic update. Look, last year we were talking about the pandemic economy as, as really evolving through three separate phases. The first phase was hibernation. And that was where government imposed lockdowns uh, were the order of the day. These were imposed on society to curtail the spread of the virus. The second phase was rebound. That was the spike in activity that occurred post hibernation. So when the, the barriers were lifted, if you like, that was the, uh, the relief rebound. The final phase, the third phase is where we are now and that's the restructure phase. The initial rebound has occurred. It's mostly worked through here in Australia and the economy is now working to find its new shape in the new world. To be clear, we are not saying that the coronavirus is finished, or, nor that the economic impacts of the coronavirus is finished. The vaccine program is certainly offering some hope, but there will be false starts, as we've been reading about recently. And it's likely that periodic localised lockdowns will remain on the table as a policy tool for governments. But the peak economic impact of COVID is probably behind us. And the world is now restructuring to find its new normal, which may well be against a backdrop of persistent residual pandemic risk. So how do we sit in the context of all of these interesting currents uh, working their way through the global economy? The title on this screen says it all. The recovery from hibernation, at least in Australia, has been V-shaped. It's been much quicker than any economist or commentator has expected, and it's been much more robust. Economists have spent the last nine months continually upgrading their projections as new data comes in ahead of expectation. And that's been consistent month after month after month. I did call that out in one of the webinars that we presented to you late last year. In mid last year, it was commonplace to see projections of 12 to 15% unemployment and also projections of house prices coming down by 20%. That sort of negativity has been well and truly reversed. While it would be a mistake to imagine that we're completely finished with the economic effects of the pandemic, it would also be foolish for us to ignore the fact that once again, the Australian economy has performed 
far better than any of us had any reason to expect, even very recently. The property market is a clear example of this stronger than expected trend. House prices are growing at the fastest rate since October 1988, the fastest rate since October 1998 when inflation was 7 or 8%. In March, they grew at an annualised rate of 39%. Growth is uniform across all capitals and regions. Capitals are now once again outperforming regionals, and that's after an extended period of time where regionals were where most of the price growth was being seen. But broadly speaking, house prices are surging across the nation. Sydney, I've got to say, is the clear leader. If it were a race, Sydney would be out in front. They are seeing an incredible rate of growth at the moment, plus 3.7% in March alone. Buyer demand is well ahead of supply. We are seeing listings increasing, but they simply cannot keep up with demand. In fact, we're seeing 1.1 property sales for every new listing. What does that do to inventory levels? It does exactly what you'd expect. It takes inventory levels, you can see them in the middle graph on screen, down to very low levels indeed, record low levels. So that, of course, is very supportive of house price growth into the medium term. What's more, it looks like there's plenty of momentum in current house price action. Auction clearance rates are testing record highs. Prices are generally not that far beyond previous peaks. So that's the hidden lead that no one at the moment is really talking about. And, and let's explore that with, with a reflection on a couple of the local markets. Take Sydney, for example. Sydney is just, despite its really strong rate of growth, it is just 2.6% above its previous peak in July 2017. If you look nationally, the level is not that much stronger. We're just 5.6% higher than we were in October 2017. Aggregate national house prices have generally gone sideways over the last four years. So when you take that into account, when you think about the shortage of supply, it's no wonder that the relief rally, which we're perhaps experiencing post hibernation, it's no wonder that, that that relief rally has expanded into a step change uplift in house prices. The test for the housing market is likely to come late this year and into 2022, when demand is likely to soften on the back of the pause in migration. In the meantime, you can bet that our Council of Financial Regulators will be watching the monthly prints very carefully to determine whether carefully calibrated macro prudential regulation will have a role to play. So that's the property market and the economy generally. Let's now turn to our quarterly headwinds and tailwinds economic report. We'll unpick some of the key factors currently influencing economic outcomes in Australia. <clears throat> we will also focus on some of the enduring themes that we have seen over the last few months and explore some new and interesting angles and insights too, I hope. So let's uh, start with headwind one, which is the closed borders that we are seeing to control the pandemic. So the effect of closed borders on population growth and select industries like tourism and education is profound. Remember that estimates now have Australia's population growth at its lowest level in over 100 years. That's back to World War I. It's fallen from 1.2% in the financial year 2020 to 0.2% in FY21 and 0.4% in FY22. Now, this slower growth is mainly due to measures taken to limit the spread of COVID-19, which of course leads to net overseas migration, falling from around 154,000 people in FY20 to around 72,000 in FY21, and then to around 22,000 in FY22. When you sum that up, that's 402,000 missing Australians. So Australians who would have been here, but for these measures, in just two years. That is a serious impact. And you can see it feeding through into, for example, offshore student visa applications down 65.3% in the year to 31 December. And that's a significant headwind for what has been a really dynamic part of the Australian economy over the last decade or so. 
The second headwind is the hair trigger that our governments have for rolling lockdowns. Last year, it was Victoria and the extended phase two lockdown that we endured in Melbourne and, and in regional Victoria. Over the last six months, every mainland Australian state, including Victoria again, has had some level of lockdown on the back of a minor coronavirus outbreak. To put a positive spin on it, each of these uh, episodes has been targeted and have been for a short period of time. And perhaps that shows that our governments, our authorities are developing some real smarts around how to execute these rolling lockdowns and contain virus spread. On the other hand, continual rolling lockdowns cause real damage to the economy. And we reflect here, especially on the small business sector. Small businesses are frequently forced to throw away perishable inventory, uh, and to make tough decisions about investment and staffing levels against a backdrop of rolling uncertainty. And all of that will weigh on consumption, it'll weigh on investment, and it will weigh on employment. And the slower than expected vaccine rollout that we're all reading about in the papers at the moment, of course, is not helping. Third headwind is the ending of JobKeeper. And, and JobKeeper ended on the 28th of March, final payments uh, being processed by the ATO through this month of April. That will undoubtedly affect some individuals, but at a macro level, it's hard to see this of having too much of an impact on the Australian economy. In fact, most income support has already been rolled off. And you can see that from the graph on the left-hand side of your screen. It's really clear from that, that most measures put in place to support income have been rolled off. So while this income support has been rolled off, we've had an incredible economic rebound. Job vacancies are at record levels. Unemployment's dropped to 5.6%, as we heard last week, just an incredible print. And you've seen how our portfolios here at Latrobe Financial are experiencing improving hardship and arrears levels. So we do have the end of JobKeeper as a headwind. It is an issue to watch, we don't deny that, but the base case in our view, and I've got to say most economists uh, reading is the same, it's more in the nature of a bump in the road than a serious risk item for the macro economy in 2021. Now, the fourth headwind we've talked about a bit, it's the most unpredictable of our headwinds and it has the potential to be the longest lasting and most significant. In the 2020 financial year, China made up 40% of our total exports or $167 billion. That's about the same as our next eight largest trading partners combined, our next eight. Sadly, China has since announced a long list of trade restrictions on Australian products, products like wine, timber, sugar, barley, copper ore, coal, even the poor old lobsters. While these industries have felt the pinch, the overall, the aggregate impact from an economic perspective on Australia has been muted. And that, of course, is because China has had an insatiable, insatiable demand for our iron ore. That's about 50% of our exports. But that doesn't mean China's out of ammunition in this, in this trade war either. In 2019, Australia earned around $12 billion from Chinese students coming to Australia to study. Now, while that industry has been put on hold for other reasons post-coronavirus, it is by no means certain that the Chinese government will facilitate or allow the resumption of this industry when travel restrictions eventually are lifted, which you know could well be well into 2022. So for Australia's economy, calming the trade tensions with China must be a key priority. So that's the headwinds. Let's now turn to the tailwinds driving our economy forward. Now, we talked about this already, but the strongest tailwind for the Australian economy is the incredible rebound from hibernation uh, and the consequent surge across a range of economic indicators, including what is, in our view, the all-important reading being employment numbers. Our expectation is that the March quarter GDP print will put the Australian economy back above its pre-pandemic peak. Now, at the end of December, we were down just 1.1% year on year, and we are expecting to overtake that in the March quarter. Employment has now overtaken pre-COVID levels, which is incredible, and that's on the back of an increase of 71,000 jobs in March, and the labour market continues to tighten. Unemployment is back at a respectable 5.6%, and the participation rate is at a record high 66.3%, really quite extraordinary prints. 
the team at Combank Research have rerun their numbers based on these better than expected economic outcomes. And they're tipping a four year budgetary windfall of a whopping $135 billion. And honestly, that number keeps growing as economic outcomes keep coming in, in ahead of expectations. So moving to our second tailwind, and that's the very expansionary policy settings that our economy is benefiting from. In previous webinars, we've discussed this whatever it takes approach that our governments and regulators have been applying to the economic support provided through the pandemic. The fiscal response can be seen from the treasury expenditure estimates on the graph on the right hand side of your screen. You can see the sizable specific COVID, re COVID response measures in financial year 20 and 21 and tailing also into FY22. A statista analysis puts total fiscal stimulus at Australia at over 19% of GDP. Now that is the fourth highest stimulus in the G20 after only Japan, the US and Germany. Now that outcome is absolutely incredible given the comparatively benign health outcomes that we've enjoyed versus many of our G20 peers. And it's a good measure of the commitment of our government and regulators to uh, supporting the economy through this period. And if there was any doubt about the unanimity of our policymakers, take a look at the April statement on monetary policy from the Reserve Bank. Now, the Reserve Bank has absolutely doubled down on its previous policy commitments. The official cash rate and three-year bond yield will be held at 0.1%. Got to say, every time I say that, I'm, I'm surprised. It's incredibly low. And it will be held at that level until 2024. There will be an additional 100 billion in bonds purchased and the term funding facility, which benefits our banks, that will continue to be available to the banks until the end of June. So their funding is absolutely locked in at very low levels, very cheap levels. So the federal government is all in. The Reserve Bank is all in, and that in itself is a serious, serious tailwind for the Australian economy. So we've seen income support from the federal government, uh, and that coupled with a resilient economy and incredibly high savings ratios. You add record low interest rates, you take the pressure off mortgage repayments via those low rates, and you can see in the middle graph on screen what the result is. Household deposits have gone through the roof and are sitting well above 1.1 trillion. That's trillion with a T. This is latent consumption waiting to be unleashed. And it is a another genuine economic tailwind. Our household balance sheets are in incredibly good shape. The final point arises from our discussion earlier about the boom in house prices. And we do see a broader economic impact arising from surging house prices. The wealth effect is an economic phenomenon that attracts a lot of attention, commentary and debate amongst economists. Put simply, the wealth effect arises because as people feel wealthier, as they see asset prices go up, they tend to spend more money. In other words, if you see the value of your home increasing, you tend to relax some of your spending disciplines a little. And when everyone across the economy does this even just a little bit, you can get a real measurable increase in aggregate economic activity. So how strong is this effect? Well, we have a recent analysis of this from the Reserve Bank. In 2019, the Reserve Bank published an analysis of the size of the wealth effect in the context of house prices. Its findings are on screen on the left-hand side there. In short, a 1% increase in housing wealth leads to a 0.16% increase in the long run level of consumption. So that, by the way, is much stronger than the effect of stock market increases. So we've run a very simple model to test the likely aggregate GDP uh, impact of GDP increases over the, sorry, sorry, of house price increases over the last six months based on this RBA study. And just on increases so far to the end of March, six months to the end of March, the aggregate contribution of the, inc uh, of the increase in long run consumption comes to 0.2% of GDP. Obviously, if the recent pattern of house price increases continues, this contribution could likewise increase and increase sharply in the months ahead. 
So that's the positive note I'd like to wrap up on. Uh, the headwinds our economy faces are real. They are substantial, but the progress already made in curtailing the coronavirus and bringing the economy out of hibernation, the commitment of our governments and regulators to doing whatever it takes, the strength of our household balance sheets, strongest they've ever been, and our really strong and active property market, all of these are significant and material drivers of our economy. So on that note, I'll turn to the broader credit industry. And the back half of last year, so the back half of 2020, saw really strong RMBS issuance. And that saw the year as a whole end as actually one of the stronger years over the last decade or so. Now, that is incredible. If I think back just 12 months, it's incredible on the back, not just of the pandemic and the resultant market volatility that it caused, but it's also remarkable, remarkable when you take into account the term funding facility, the surge in household deposits, all of which resulted in our banks being incredibly well funded and having very little need to go to debt capital markets. What's more, the comparatively strong Aussie outcome and the flood of liquidity across the world has assured continued demand for the paper issued by our RMBS issuers, particularly backed by Australian property, they, they, those assets are particularly attractive. And so pricing for RMBS notes has dropped to record low levels. And you can see that from the graph on the bottom left hand side of your screen. The Structured Finance Support Fund has served its purpose of maintaining market confidence admirably. And, and the fact that it's deployed nothing like the $15 billion that was set aside for it shows that fast and coordinated policy responses can actually reduce the check size ultimately required. It's, it's a living, breathing economic embodiment of a stitch in time saving nine, truly. And as at 31 March, the availability period for the forbearance facility ended. So you'll recall that the forbearance facility is the facility provided by the Australian Office for Financial Management to cover lenders for repayments by borrowers that were not being received due to hardship arrangements. It's entirely appropriate in our view that the forbearance facility be ended given the really strong recovery that the borrowers have experienced across the industry. I should note for the record that Latrobe Financial didn't make any application for hardship relief at any time. We did, however, think that the facility was very prudent policy making by our regulators at an incredibly volatile moment in the market. So um, hats off to all our regulators and governments for their very quick and coordinated response there. Let's conclude the presentation as we always do by way of summary with a quick survey of the sector and any remaining topical issues that are arising in commentary generally. Our business is in excellent shape. So we heard from our earliest part of this presentation uh, that we are in a really robust condition. Moments like the last 12 months reinforce to us the importance of emphasising a strong balance sheet and liquidity position. And that's a really effective buffer, of course, against adverse market events. Our corporate balance sheet is in excellent shape. We're highly profitable. In fact, there was not a single month through the COVID period in which we didn't grow as a business. And that was notwithstanding all the volatility that we saw in markets. Our business model means that we are highly liquid, we're highly cash flow generative, and our capital position is strong. It's also self-sustaining against the growth of the business. So we're really well positioned to continue to grow and develop as a business in the months and the years ahead. Turning to interest rates, well, the official cash rate is at the record low of 0.1 of 1%, as I said earlier, and the Reserve Bank has continued its process to suppress the three-year yield curve to match this. In its April statement, uh, the Reserve Bank confirmed that it will keep these settings until we have full employment. Now, there's some ambiguity about precisely what full employment means, but they will, they will keep these settings till we have full employment and inflation sustainably within the target range, which is, of course, 2 to 3%. The Reserve Bank has already signaled it doesn't expect these conditions to be satisfied until at least 2024. But when you think this through a bit further, even that time frame seems aggressive. Now, given what we've seen over the last few months, it is entirely possible that employment could continue its downward trajectory. It's not off the cards that something like full employment, however you would define it, could be achieved by 2024. 
but the secular downward pressures on inflation. So I'm talking about things we've discussed previously, demographics, automation, these are going to persist for the foreseeable future. What's more, even if we do get this inflation, even if it does come through, that inflation actually could be a welcome mitigant to the increasing increasing debt pile that the world is accumulating. So it's likely that come 2024, we'll see some tolerance around the world, not just here in Australia, but around the world for higher inflation levels. And that's assuming, of course, as I said at the start, that we can somehow conjure those levels. The net effect of all of this is that interest rates, sadly, will still be lower for still longer. Turning to borrower credit standards and given what's happening with house prices, we do see credit standards as, a, as an area of focus for the uh, Council of Financial Regulators. So that's ASIC, APRA, the Reserve Bank. That will be a real area of focus for them and probably over the next 24 months or so. So far, APRA data indicates that the banks have maintained vigilance here. So the Council of Financial Regulators has recently commented on that and confirmed that they're comfortable with current settings and what they're seeing in, in new loans being written. Investor credit growth remains subdued Riskier lending types like high LVR loans are still at very low levels, but this will be a watching brief from now on. You can expect to see lots of commentary uh, on this issue in the press. We turn now to the regulatory environment. The big ticket discussion point in the regulatory space at present, of course, would have to be the federal government's proposal to replace the responsible lending laws in the National Consumer Credit Protection Act with the APRA lending standards as set out in APG 220. Now, as with most regulatory changes, the devil's in the detail, but let us, let, I'll just make some high level observations. We can say with some confidence that the impact on us is, un, is, is likely to be minimal. We might benefit in a minor way from some efficiencies around the technical and formal requirements of responsible lending, but the government's already stated that key elements of APG 220 will apply to non-banks and those standards are broadly consistent with ASIC's Regulatory Guide 209, which is the current regulatory guidance. What's more, those changes will apply across the market. So it's going to be competitively neutral. The, competitively dyna the competitive dynamic will be ultimately unchanged. We'll still see the banks competing ferociously for vanilla assets and doing a good job in doing so. We at Latrobe will continue to focus on our distinctive space that supports the types of really strong retur returns that we're seeking to generate for investors. At the heart of the issue of credit regulation, of course, is how much emphasis should be put on responsible uh, lending by the lender, caveat venditor, as lawyers would say, versus responsible borrowing by the borrower, or caveat emptor. None of this means, and, and this is an important point to understand, none of this means that lending is in any scenario going to be unregulated in Australia. The APRA standards outlined in APG 220 will continue to apply if the government's proposals get up. Uh, and there is, in fact, a new overarching set of design and distribution obligations being imposed on lenders that require lenders to ensure that their products are suitable for their target markets. So lending, <laughs> sadly, perhaps, but, um, but, but uh, on balance, I think it's good for the market that lending is hard baked in Australia as a highly regulated activity. Frankly, it's appropriate that there be proper regulation around the financing of the most significant and costly purchase in most people's lives, which is, uh, which is of course, their home. In terms of the sector generally, look, as we've already seen, the primary securitisation markets have been really active. That's continued into 2021. Record low pricing is making issuance very attractive, especially for those lenders with constrained funding models. We at Latrobe will continue our practice of measured and programmatic issuance, and we'll do that consistent with our internal strategic and economic hurdles. We will always be doing so with a focus on quality assets, profitability, sound capital management, and diversification of funding sources. Net of all of this, the outlook for the business, the outlook for the sector is incredibly supportive and prospective. So we'll be focused, highly focused, on continuing to deliver market leading outcomes for our investors. Now on that note, I'll turn to some of the questions that have come through. Pat has asked about our peer-to-peer -peer offerings. Thank you, Pat. And uh, when will we be releasing higher volumes on our weekly shopping list? Look, thanks, Pat. Great question. Oh, it's a difficult one. Look, our peer-to-peer -peer offerings are in incredible demand on the moment. at the moment. 
On top of that, we've had the constrained property and credit market of 2020 that, of course, as you might recall from, from webinars last year, means that we've effectively had to rebuild our lending pipeline. That's been extremely successful. Indeed, we saw well over a billion dollars worth of really good quality asset originations last month alone. That cadence appears to be continuing, perhaps even building, but it does take some time for those loans to be settled and to move through into our portfolios and onto the peer-to-peer -peer shopping list. So please do bear with us there, Pat. Jane, I'm looking at Jane. Jane has asked whether our offerings are term deposits. The answer is no, Jane, they're not. Latrobe Financial is not a bank. We are not regulated by APRA and our offerings are not guaranteed by the Australian government's uh, deposit guarantee scheme. Uh, and I'd say further, we've just got no intentional plans to become a bank. Banks are subject to the federal government's bank deposit guarantee scheme. Uh, their deposit rates are unsupp unsurprisingly extremely low. In fact, they've been consistently lower than the medium term inflation rate for a very long period of time. That of course means that investors are actually losing capital value by leaving money in the bank. Our approach is fundamentally different. We are an investment fund our objective is to deliver consistent, real monthly income and to prioritise investor capital. None of our portfolios, the classic notice uh, account, the 90 day notice account, 12 month high yield accounts, none of them has ever lost a cent of capital for our investors. Likewise, we've never lost a cent of capital for any of our institutional investors over seven decades. That's a really powerful track record and one that we are entirely focused on retaining. Uh, to to get to the bottom of this and to understand our approach in a bit more detail, I'd really encourage you to go to our website and to review our monthly portfolio report, our snapshot and metrics report. We can get a really good insight just from reading that report as to what it is we do with the funds invested with us. Stan is asking where we see interest rates on home loans and investments going in the next 12 months. Uh, Stan, I'll answer this in a few parts. The official cash rate is probably not going anywhere, and that's for the reasons I've outlined earlier. The Reserve Bank has a real bias to letting the economy run hot uh, for the next, say, three years at least. That's good for existing borrowers, it's true. It's obviously not good news for investors. Um, now, I'd make an additional point on that, which is that the super sharp rates coming from uh, coming from the banks for their for their loans for the very vanilla loans, they've probably hit their low point. They might even start to increase slightly over time. That's of course because we're coming to the end of the availability of the term funding facility. We did see not so long ago the Reserve Banking, uh, the, sorry, the Commonwealth Bank increase its three year fixed rate. Uh, and, and you could expect to see a little bit more of this from banks more broadly over the next few months. So Stan, look, as an investor, probably not ideal news for you there, but we are here at Latrobe Financial doing our bit to, to, to assist you. Um, we've got another, I'll jump to this question from Ray because it's related. If uh, interest rates increase, will Latrobe increase the rate paid on their investments? So that's, that's an easy one, Ray. So, uh, in the happy circumstance from an investor's perspective that interest rates start to increase again, the answer is yes. Over time, Latrobe Financial's interest rates are likely to increase as well. Now, I'll just add here, our rates are not linked to the official cash rate directly. So just because the Reserve Bank moves up or down, it doesn't automatically result in a change to our interest rates. And investors who've been with us over many years have seen how we've managed to shield them from many Reserve Bank decreases over a period of time. However, when borrower rates across the market are generally increasing, over time, this will pass through into our portfolios and in, and in due course results in an uplift to rates of return for investors. We've got another question here about our peer-to-peer -peer investments from Sarah and uh, instances where there are capital shortfalls. Great question, Sarah. Look, in peer-to-peer -peer invest, investment, investors choose the individual loan that they're investing in. So if for whatever reason the borrower goes, uh, goes delinquent and stops making repayments and then there's a problem with the security property and the loan results in a shortfall, in those circumstances, investors do bear that loss directly. So that's passed directly through to those underlying investors. Now, this is a relatively rare circumstance. I was talking earlier about our shortfall history across the fund and uh, the three-year shortfall history for the select investment account is 0.14 of 
So that's just 14 cents in every $100 lent per annum. So it's a very strong track record. Uh, and as a manager, we're working very hard to reduce these risks. And we do that by very careful credit assessment of the borrowers, low loan to value ratios, very active management of any delinquent borrowers. And that's produced outstanding outcomes over the years for our investors. But it is true that investors need to make really sure that they're very comfortable with their exposures when they build their peer-to-peer -peer portfolio. Now, we're not permitted to provide advice at Latrobe Financial, but a fundamental tool of portfolio construction is diversification. And investors always should be reflecting on diversification as one of the tools to help them reduce their overall risk profile. Now, just down to our last couple of questions now. Um, any indication that interest rates will be started? So we've covered that one from Philip. Danny Rishan, did Latrobe receive any job keeper payments? No, Danny, we, we, we didn't. Um, how is Latrobe Financial placed from Joan? How is Latrobe Financial placed if inflation takes off? Really good question, Joan. So one of the disciplines that we have always applied as a lender is to ensure that the bulk of our portfolio is comprised of variable rate loans. Now, what that means for us as a manager and as a lender is that we are agnostic to the settings of interest rates in the economy. So if you have high inflation over time, you expect interest rates to go up. What we like to do is have most of our portfolio set to variable rates so that as market rates increase, the, our borrower rates increase uh, accordingly, and that is then passed through into our portfolio. So you would describe the portfolio at Latrobe Financial, and in fact, our, our, our entire investment strategy as being generally very inflation responsive. So I hope, Joan, that assists you there. Uh, and final question for Al, from Alex, what is your view on the reports of higher household savings versus higher household debt? How would that scenario play out? So household savings are at record levels. Higher household debt, it is true, uh, is, is something that we are dealing with, Alex, and that will have to be dealt with over a period of time. You might, might refer to my earlier comments about um, you know, some potential motivations for our regulators having a tolerance for higher inflation levels going forward. Um, but what we're actually fi finding is that the cost of servicing household debt is actually at the lowest level it has been in the entire 21st century. So here we are in 2021, you have to go back to the 1990s for it to find a time when a lower proportion of household income was being used to service debt. So as a matter of fact, the debt burden that Australian households are bearing at the moment is exceptionally, exceptionally manageable for them, which is why, you know, when you look at, for example, the Reserve Bank's financial stability report, it's consistently finding that Australian households are in a very strong position. Now, in the long term, obviously, we can't continue increasing our debt levels. And that will be a real focus for regulators as they start to unwind some of these emergency policy settings. But I've got to say, Alex, there are two tools that they will do to do it. It will be very slow, steady, measured steps. And there will be a tolerance for higher inflation to inflate some of that debt away over time. And that's a very powerful tool. It's sort of the, the flip side, if you like, the policy makers version of compound interest. Now we do have some other questions on screen. I'm sorry, I can't get to all of those questions today, but we will contact uh, anyone we didn't get to to uh, discuss their questions. Thank you once again for your attendance and interest in our credit fund. It has been and continues to be our pleasure to be able to assist you with your investments. And I'll now, now pass back to Michael Watson to wrap this morning's proceedings up. Thank you, Chris, and to all of our attendees. Thank you once again for joining us today and your continued interest in Latrobe Financial. If you'd like to discuss your investments with us or speak to us on any issue, please contact our investment team on 1800 818 818. On behalf of all of us at Latrobe Financial, we wish you a great month ahead.